Well, on behalf of the uh, family and the family here at Oakdale, I welcome you all to this uh, celebration of life. Um, I would say a life well lived and lived to the fullest. Uh, there were a few Eddieisms in that slideshow. One of them was the trademark Eddie grin that rarely left his face. I think I saw him a few times when it wasn't present, but not very often. The second one uh, that I picked up on there was uh, his love of music. And probably the most important part of his life, I think, was people and how he touched lives and how people's lives touched him. And he valued that a lot. Let's pray. Holy Father God, Almighty, creator of this universe, author and perfecter of our faith, you lead us in paths that sometimes we don't want to tread. Father, I just pray your presence here this morning as we celebrate this life, this life well lived, this life of service rendered, this life of friendships, this life of uh, kingdom building that Eddie was part of. Help us to celebrate this day like he lived uh, to the fullest. Father, we ask your Holy Spirit here to help us with this. And I ask your spirit to be on uh, the Durst brothers and on Dale as they continue with the program here in a few minutes. Lord, may this, uh, may this gathering just be to your honor and to your glory. We ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Edward Davis Eddy Goldman, 80, of Grantsville, Maryland, died on October 16th, 2023, at Goodwill Retirement Community in Grantsville. He was born on August the 30th, 1943, in Salisbury, North Carolina. He was the son of the late Julius Leslie, Sonny, and Helen Sokol Goldman. He was also preceded in death by his wife, Betty Goldman, and one brother, Joseph Goldman. Eddie worked for Snowmakers Inter International, SMI as most of us know it, for over a decade. He had also been a bookkeeper accountant, having been the bookkeeper for Earth and Tree. He was a veteran, having served with the U.S. Naval Air National Guard. Eddie received his Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration from the University of North Carolina. He was a member of the Oakdale Church, Salisbury, Pennsylvania, where he served as a treasurer for many years. Eddie was the wash tub bass player for the Durst Brothers Band. He is survived by one son, Charles Tripp, Rebecca Harden, Huntersville, North Carolina, one daughter, Jennifer Bergen, Charlotte, North Carolina, two brothers, Charles and Norma Goldman, Salisbury, North Carolina, Lee B.B. Goldman, Grantsville, and one grandson, not in the obit, whom he valued a great deal, Evan Alexander Harden. In lieu of flowers, contributions may be made to the AAUW Goldman Scholarship Fund, care of Eileen Hanson Kelly, 1109 Timber Spring Lane, Salisbury, North Carolina, 28147. We're going to see a short video clip here, and at the conclusion of that, the Durst brothers are gonna come up and give us some special music, and then my brother Dale Curtis is going to regale us with the word. Oh my God, look how big he is. Shh, huge. Oh, he's turned over a rock or something. Ashton. He just turned something over, a rock or something. What a lovely moment me. What a lovely name for the sun.
Hi everybody, <clears throat> we're the Goldmans. Over here is Eddie Goldman on Washita Base, BB Goldman over here on Sixth Street, and I'm Lee. So uh, this is <clears throat> going down the road. Uh, together our combined age is uh, 235 years, <laughs> and our combined IQ is about 100 now. <laughs> so here we go, <clears throat> going down the road. It's good to be here on these conditions, but it is good to be on these conditions because we know where Eddie's at, and that is the joy that, is the, that takes the sting out of death, is knowing that our loved ones, and it is a celebration of life because we all know we're going to face that day, and the worst thing you can do for your family is having them not knowing where you are. And many a times we've been in funerals, and they always ask the question, but for Eddie... There's no question about where Brother Eddie's at. Through many, we've been together as the Durst brothers and Brother Eddie has been with us and uh, never was official because he always had hair. <laughs> so we always said that, but he's been with us for 10 years and for over 10 years, uh, nursing home ministry, uh, senior center ministry, um, uh, picnics and things like that, all those things. Brother Eddie was there, many talks about the Lord many things like that and uh, all those things. So we're going to sing the first song we're going to do is the one that Eddie really liked. This was his favorite song. And I believe it was because uh, during this song it has a sort of a, um, an Eastern type beat to it. And, uh, and the words are perfect for what we're going through today as well. It's called The Traveler. This old life is tempting, but this old life ain't long. You work so hard to make it, in a moment it's all gone. Please don't think I'm crazy, I might be a little odd, but I'm looking for that city whose builder is God. I am just a traveler, I won't be staying long. But this is not my city, but this is not my home. And if I act a little strange, well, I'm just passing through. I'm looking for that city. Dear brother, how about you? Oh, I'm looking for that city. I'm looking for that city. I'm looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. Now listen to me, Christian, as you travel along. Keep your eyes on Jesus, for that's where they belong. The world may try to tempt you, it'll try and drag you away. Keep looking for that city, we're gonna get there one day. Oh, I'm looking for that city, I'm looking for that city, I'm looking for that city who's been. Just a traveler, I won't be staying long. 
This is not my city. This is not my home. And if I act a little strange while well, I'm just passing through, I'm looking for that city. Dear brother, how about you? And that he was looking for that city, and that's where he's at today. Amen? Praise the Lord. You know, that's our blessed hope. Now, we also want to share that we always had fun. You know, like I said, they talked about Eddie's smile. We always had fun. And I'd always look over at him, and he would be smiling as we was playing. He always had a smile on his face as he was playing. And we had some jokes that we used along the way, but I'll share those when we come up to do our, uh, our little uh, sing-along at the end. But Brother Denny, did you want to share something with about Brother Eddie? Yeah, a couple things there. I'll you get the mic? Yeah, get the mic. Most of the comments when we was at many, like Brother Rodney said, we've been all over the tri-state area in many places, senior centers, churches, and many, and he always had that smile. Uh, and I know you all know that too, and it just, you know, the way this world is, to have someone like him always had that smile on his face, no matter what he went through. And if we all could just keep that smile on our faces at all times, like Eddie did, wouldn't that be a blessing? But he, he always had that smile, even though he was going through some times, like we all do, trials and tribulations. But us as followers of Christ know that we're going to go through some trials and tribulations. But uh, there's many things, many of you, uh, know, a lot of you know us, and we know a lot of you all also. But, you know, I'll, I have a handicapped daughter, uh, Michelle's her name, and uh, she would always enjoy going, going to our sings and stuff. And... Uh, she would always uh, kid Eddie all the time, and uh, uh, when we travel around or go uh, to the Tri-State area or something, when Michelle was able to go with us, she'd always say, hey, Eddie, she said, we all need to get a motel room for the night. <laughs> and, of course, Eddie, you know how Eddie was, he'd say, Michelle, we're going to get a motel tonight. He said, yes, we're all going to get a motel tonight because you're going to be singing all night, and I can just see... Uh, the joy, and Eddie always talked about my daughter, and my daughter always talked about him, too. And that's one of the special memories I always remember. The way Eddie smiled at people, and the, and the good personality he had, and uh, yes, he will sadly be missed. But there's many, other, many, many, many other memories I could share with you. That he sure was a blessing to the Thirst Band, and also to many people in the Tri-State area. And he, yes, he will be sadly missed, but we know he's home. Amen? Amen. All right. And one thing I will say before we sing the last song here, or the next song, um, Eddie didn't care if we ever got paid or anything like that. There was never a question on his mind. But he always asked the question, are we going to get fed? <laughs> he always wanted to make sure if we go somewhere to say that we're going to get fed. And actually, we had one place one time where we sang. I wasn't going to say this, but I'll tell you this. We had a place where we sang down at a, a special event down in a, a town in Allegheny County. It wasn't uh, really a gospel thing. It was for a fundraiser type thing. And because we, uh, we just thought customarily, they always have something for the band when they have dinner. But that night, they didn't. <laughs> and uh, even my brother's daughters went down with us that time, and she wanted... She thought, because we didn't eat, because we thought that we was going to eat there, and she, uh, she wanted something, and they, they finally gave her a cup of coffee, I think. Coffee. But Eddie was really said, wow. He said, I never thought I would see this, where they come and, and, they, and they didn't have anything for the band, so because uh, it was a fundraiser or something. Anyhow, this next song we want to do is one that uh, kind of sing it as a little uh, thing. We sang Eddie's favorite song. And now we're going to sing Eddie's not favorite song. Because this song at the very end, if we can get it right, it had a part of playing the wash tub that all the years we practiced, and I didn't realize until almost two years ago that he didn't like this song. Because at the very end, we really, he really speeded up. And really for the wash tub bass, it was nothing much he could do to keep up. So he finally told us, you know, why do we do that song? I like the words, but I don't like the ending. So we're going to play that song, just as kind of a little teaser to Eddie. It goes like this. Now, brother, 
What does the King James say? King James says, verily, verily. New International says, truly, truly. And down south they say, sure, sure enough, enough, sure, sure enough. enough. We're going to have a sure enough good time when we make it home. We're going to have a sure enough good time when we see the throne. But the battle's on and the war is hot. We got to do our part. We're going to have a sure enough good time when we make it home. Well, Jesus never said this life would be swell. You know we're in a battle with the forces of hell. But we may get pushed around. You might feel a little pain. Well, it's worth it all just to know with Jesus we're going to reign. We're going to have a sure enough good time when we make it home. We're going to have a sure enough good time when we see the throne. But the battle's on and the war is hot. We got to do our part. We're going to have a sure enough good time when we make it home. Well, I heard some preacher talking just the other day. He said the Lord was about to send a big Cadillac my way. Well, I don't want to argue, fuss or pick a bone. What good is a Cadillac in the middle of a combat zone? We're going to have a sure enough good time when we make it home. We're going to have a sure enough good time when we see the throne. But the battle's on and the war is hot. We're going to do our part. We're going to have a sure enough good time when we make it home. We're going to have a sure enough good time when we make it home. We're going to have a sure enough good time when we see the throne. But the battle's on and the war is hot. We're going to do our part. We're going to have a sure enough good time when we make it home. Amen. Amen. Sure enough good time. Green light. So uh, I first, I didn't know who Eddie Goldman was until about 13 years ago when we started attending Oakdale. And for most of the last 13 years, I barely really knew him. I think I attended one of his community or a couple of the community groups, uh, fellowship group, home, we call them home, home fellowships or whatever. Uh, many years ago, um, and I guess we actually, Rhoda and I knew Betty even a little bit better. But in the last year or so, um, as Eddie has had really needed, um, as his health declined, um, I got to know him in a very special way. I filled in quite a bit. Uh, for Lee and BB, uh, for Lee, um, when you guys were in Florida. And I got to know this guy <laughs> in a way that I never knew. I mean, um, of course, I, you know, I, I talked with him. I, for a while, I headed up the missions team, and I got to uh, talk with him sometimes about uh, where we're sending our giving and all that. Sometimes we even butted heads a little bit. And uh, he would often, whenever that happened, he'd say, well, that's what Vernon was saying, <laughs> you know, that we should be doing. But uh, anyway, I got to know him a little bit on, uh, on that level, and that was always, that was uh, good. But until I really started, um, uh, I, I, for some reason, I just kind of stepped up to the plate and just started loving on him and uh, 
this past year helped him get to uh, a lot of his medical appointments. And uh, so we got to talk quite a bit, especially on those trips to all the way over to Morgantown, right? And, uh, and so I enjoy, and I realized, like I never knew before, just what a rich and full life this guy had. I mean, he, I, he would tell me things, and I think my mouth probably dropped open because, you know, you see someone the way they are right, you know, currently, and then you I have no idea that it was really like that. And what a rich and full life he really had. And, uh, but along the way, he gave accolades to so many people that, that he treasured so dearly. Um, you know, I had a little introduction, but I don't think it needs to be said, really. Um, but I'd be remiss, really, if I didn't mention some of the people that were so important in his life, especially in the last couple years as his, as his health declined. Um, so I'm just going to, and, you know, anytime somebody does something like this, inevitably somebody's going to be missed. And so if your name isn't specifically mentioned, uh, you know what you meant to Eddie. And, uh, uh, yeah, so anyway, um, Lee and Bibi and the rest of the family, especially Lee and all that you did for Eddie, just how you stepped up to the plate. And in the last months, we're living at your place, how he lived at your place when he couldn't really handle things on his own. But you know how desperately he wanted to get back to his own digs, right? He wanted to get back to his own place. And Jeff and Susie, my word, what you guys did, and Ashton, and how he loved on you guys and how you loved on him, just absolutely amazing, especially in the last few months of his life. And how you enabled him to actually go back over to his house, uh, which was just over and above. <laughs> I don't even, I shouldn't even call it a call of duty because you didn't see it that way. It was just really all from your heart. And it was just, it, it was totally amazing what you guys did. And Brian, is Brian here? Brian, yeah, Desenzo. Um, Lord, you didn't let him get out of wood. <laughs> you, know, you kept his wood and other stuff, right? And Lynn, uh, he, did you know that he viewed you as uh, uh, his prayer warrior? Somebody that, that had a special prayer avenue with the Lord? He viewed you that way. Kathy Hale Cooper, uh, Rick and Mary, John and Michelle, Jim and Isolde. And see, I'm reading a list here, so inevitably I'm going to miss somebody, right? Uh, Amy, Amy Walker, uh, Greg Wagner, Vernon, uh, <laughs> Vernon. And the interesting thing was, as we would talk, he would talk about each and every one of these folks that, and how much they actually meant to him. I was thinking, whoa, man, you... you you, your life has touched so many lives. And so many people uh, loved you to the point where they would step up to the plate when things weren't going well. Wendell and Darlene, uh, Wayne and Glenn at Earth and Tree, and how he valued that time there. And in the last month or so of his life, of course, Garrett... Um, County Hospice and Goodwill Nursing Home. And <laughs> I want to tell you a little funny story. Um, I remember being with him one time down at the wound clinic, and there was a new girl at the receptionist thing, you know, getting the information. And she was asking him a couple questions, and, um, and Eddie said, uh, I make wars. She said, 
You what? I make wars. And of course, I'm saying a little bit more of that, you know. And then I stepped up and said, wires. Oh, okay. I got it now. But uh, he, um, can I say something else about um, Jeff and Susie? Jeff and Susie, you may not know this, but uh, this is what Lee gave me. He didn't specifically tell me to say this. I, I don't believe he did, but um, you should hear this. You really should. We can't say too much about what a blessing it was for Eddie and our entire family that Susie, Jeff, and Ashton Lash Latshaw came to live at Eddie's. They gave him the love and care that he needed to have the best, literally, the best two months, I think, of his life, at least in the last years, okay? And this is in his final year, of course. Jeff kept his yard and grounds in beautiful condition. They set up his room at Goodwill and continued to visit him and call on him on almost a daily basis. We will forever love them for their Christian kindness. And I think it went even beyond that. Your love for him was very evident. And as you saw in the Black Bear video, uh, he was hugging on Ashton, I think. Look, Ashton, look at the bear. <laughs> and I'd be further remiss if I didn't say something about SMI. Um, to, to understand a little bit about Eddie's relationship and how he felt about SMI, and uh, I was with him for this past year often when he'd say, I've got to get back to work. I've got to get back to work. And you look at it and say, Eddie, um, just take it, <laughs> take a couple days, you know, re regain your strength, whatever. But um, I don't think it's out of place at all to read part of his resignation letter that he wrote to headquarters uh, last December. And, but you need to know that even though he resigned, officially resigned, as an, I, and if I, I might have some of this wrong, John, but um, as an employee, he continued in his job in a different classification of employment, and which was so absolutely valuable to him. It was amazing. He talked talk to me about, he, he was so blessed by that. But I'm going to read you this little portion of what he wrote in his resignation letter so you understand where he really was in his heart regarding this opportunity, that he, this employment opportunity. He said this, he said, and you, you and the rest, this was uh, written to Sherry at the, uh, in uh, home base, home office, I guess. You and the rest of your family will never know how much I have appreciated the opportunity to have a second career in my later life. This job has extended my life for many years. And I hope it, I didn't think I was going to do that. <laughs> And I hope it has contributed to the success of SMI. Thank you again for the best job. Listen to this. For the best job I ever had. And I think he meant that. I really do. And all the things that he, do, he had done in his life. Uh, I think that's really pretty amazing. I think it says it all. Merry Christmas to all at headquarters in Michigan. Uh, 
So anyway, I already told you about all the discussions, all the time that we, Eddie and I had to talk. We talked about all kinds of things. And um, one of the most interesting things to me, not the most, but one of the most interesting things was hearing about all the stuff he did and uh, the businesses, you know, just all the things. I thought, man, what a rich and full life. But I must confess, as a pastor and evangelist, <laughs> the, um, uh, the most meaningful things to me were the spiritual discussions that we had. And I... I appreciated the fact that we had 50 minutes or an hour, you know, sometimes, you know, to, as we're traveling. And uh, I also have to admit that sometimes I probably got in his face a little bit. And, uh, <laughs> but we talked about everything from, from oh, we talked about everything from heaven to hell and everything in between. And what it really means to be a Christian and uh, um, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that we can know as a believer in Christ, we can truly know. I had a pastor one time said, how do you really, how, how do you really know? He says, you know, you know in your knower. <laughs> you know deep down inside that it's so. And so Jesus wants all his children, all those that really know him, to know that they have eternal life, not, not question, not wonder, not hope or anything like that, but that we can know. So we talked about all kinds of things relating to our eternal destination, um, uh, what works and what doesn't. We spent time talking about works and how works isn't going to get us there. And, uh, but this one particular day, and I, I don't have my memory about this verbatim, but please bear with me here. But I do remember one particular day, um, we talked more than usual about spiritual things. We were traveling to Morgantown. And I guess it'd be more appropriate for me to say that I talked more than usual. <laughs> because at one point, <laughs> and this is funny, but at one point uh, I said, uh, Eddie, do you think I'm being a little bit too direct or you know, too personal you know, here, you know, um, too over the top or you know, whatever? And you know, when a pastor or evangelist asks that question, he, <laughs> he's really kind of expecting the person to say, oh, no, I need to hear this. <laughs> oh, oh, no, that, um, you're fine. You know, uh, uh, I even had some people at a different, at a different time, oh, no, that's what we need, stepping on our toes. <laughs> Just thinking, well. um, so when I asked Eddie that question, uh, he kind of crunched up against the window. And he said, uh, yep. <laughs> A little bit. And you know, ever since that time, and I know it's this way for you guys too, some of the family, but you know when you call Eddie, and I'm, I know this is coming through weird, but when you call Eddie, he, he, I mean, I guess he says this to you guys too. He says, what's up? What's up? But after this particular time, in my head I'm thinking, that he's going to say, what are you going to say now? <laughs> What's Dale going to say now? Lynn, you know me, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I remember that this particular day we did talk about a particular passage of Scripture. And one that's very important to me, and it's been very important to me in my ministry over many years. But it's in Romans chapter 10 where the Apostle Paul said, what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. And he explains, actually, by saying, the word of faith. 
that we preach. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Think about his audience. Think about when he was saying that and how radical, how absolutely radical that statement was because he was not saying faith and your sacraments, faith and your works, faith and um, whatever else you want to add to it. Many people add to their faith. Now, that's not that works aren't important. We're supposed to add, the Bible says very clearly, add to your faith works. James says that, right? It's, it is important for a believer, but we dare not get the cart before the horse. Our works aren't going to save us. Our, the sacramental stuff we do is not going to save us. As a matter of fact, it doesn't really earn us any, point, any specific points with God related to our eternal destiny and salvation. But what Paul is actually saying, this word of faith, faith alone, not as Titus 3 says, not by works of righteousness that we've done, but by his mercy, he saved us. And again, in Ephesians chapter 2, we, the, the famous two verses, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, lest anyone should boast about it. Not of yourselves. In other words, we, you, could, you can swim upstream all you want. You can do all kinds of things for God. But if it doesn't start, with a true relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, somewhere, sometime, you gave your heart and life to Jesus Christ and, and now you know it. Now you know it. You know that you belong to him. And then it goes on to say that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, what does that mean? That means that our confession as a believer ought to be consistent with what's really happened in our heart. You know, it's absolutely amazing to me the older I get, and the older I get, I, I don't take things for granted. I want to, if I get to know someone uh, that says they're a believer, in Jesus. Now hear me, hear what I'm going to say here. If I get to know someone and in our pastoral care ministry, I've gotten to know many, quite a few folks near the end of their life and I get to talk to them. I've gotten, had the privilege of getting to know some of these folks and talking to them. And you know, one of the things that I ask and this is relating to confession, the confession of our faith. Somewhere along the line, I'll just say, well, how did you come to Christ? Or what's your story? What, what's your testimony? You know, what do you have? And do you know what? More than once, I've gotten this deer in the headlight looks like, what do you mean? And folks, I got to tell you, this is just me, but I take advantage of those opportunities to share the gospel just in case this person that maybe has been in church all their life doesn't truly know Christ as their Savior. Think about it this way. When we stand before Jesus, and we all will, How many will say, Lord, I did this, and I didn't do this, <laughs> or I, you know, I avoided this, and, you know, I did this or whatever. Oh, I, 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 I did this faithfully or whatever. But Jesus literally, please hear me, literally will say to many, 
Remember that the scripture says very clearly, straight is the way that leads to life. Few there be that find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many go therein. It's King James. But there's, there will be far too many people when they stand before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that will be without excuse because they trusted in something other than his finished work at Calvary. When Jesus said, it is finished, it was finished. And he, as it says in John 14, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. Many people just play games with this thing. But it's a sad state of affairs that many will hear him say, what did you do? I don't care about anybody else. I don't care about anybody else around you or anybody else that you're looking to. I'm better than that guy. I'm better than that. What did you do with the gift that I died to provide for you? What did you do with it? And many, if they're going to be honest in that day, will have to say, I trampled it under my feet. I just trampled it under my feet. So when Eddie, uh, let me continue on. And this verse 10, I love the most because it says, um, well, let me finish verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth, in other words, he is the, our confession. Our confession is consistent with what's happened in our heart and life, right? And believe in your heart, in your heart, deep down, that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For it's with the heart that one believes resulting in righteousness. And it's with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Without that, no one will see the Lord, at least in, in his glory and what he has prepared for us. Which incidentally, that's something else we talked about. I'm not going to get into it now, but we talked at length about heaven. And, the, you know, I, I grew up with cartoons. My mom didn't know what to do. She put me in front of a TV, you know. <laughs> and I got accustomed to cartoon characters, you know, biting the dust somehow, you know. And you see them, you know, with X's on their eyes and, and a sheet, you know, maybe playing a little harp and, you know, going up in a cloud. What a pitiful idea of what heaven is. The Bible says there's going to be a new heavens and new earth. And I believe personally that the, the most beautiful thing that has ever happened in our life, the most beautiful picture, the most beautiful thing that ever hit our heart is only a little glimpse of what God has prepared for them that love him. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Is that your testimony? Really, folks, is that your testimony? Do you know in your heart of hearts that when you leave this life and Rodney, I believe you're exactly 100% correct. In my conversations with him, with Eddie, I think he was ready. Especially right at, right at the end. He may have had some doubts. A lot of us have doubts. But I think he was fully assured at the end. So I want us all to think about it. 
Is that us? Is that me? The disciple that was perhaps closest to Jesus, the Apostle John, you know, 40-some years, I think, after Jesus' ascension, resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven, which incidentally, um, uh, some historians say, hey, you know, there's more historical evidence that all that really happened than even Julius Caesar existing. Can you believe that? <laughs> but John says this, please hear this. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. So where does this word find you today? I'm hopeful that it's on the right side of what God is saying here to all of us. If that is your testimony, as it was with Eddie, then we can confidently claim what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we all shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must, underline must, this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immor immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory, and only then, only then, can we legitimately clay, lay claim to the next verse. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? It certainly isn't here. Because I've been blood bought by the Lord of Lords, King of Kings, the one who created. He, many people don't even think of Jesus that way, but the Bible very clearly says he created everything. Read 1 John, read the first chapter of Colossians. It very clearly says, and he is the one that wants to take control of our life and, co and come into and cause us to know him, really know him as our savior. And then Paul finishes this out by saying, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law, many people just leave it there. But we're not going to leave it there. Because <laughs> it says, goes on to say, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, you see our hearts Lord, I thank you for allowing me the privilege of getting to know Eddie so well over the last year in particular. And Lord, as we sit here today, you see us, you know what's in our hearts. And Lord, if there's someone here today that isn't really sure of their standing with you, have any real question about it, I pray that today is the day, Lord, that they would look to you and say, Lord, you know, I know you died for me.
I want all of what you died to give me. Lord, save me. Bring me into relationship with you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And I want to conclude with this, too. It's not an actual prayer, but it's a statement of absolute fact. And this is to the family and actually to all his close friends. It is our prayer that the God of all peace, the Lord Jesus Christ, grant to all of us, family, friends, and even closer friends, the comfort and peace needed that only Jesus Christ can provide. And it's in his name we say all this. Everybody said Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the Durst brothers to come back. Oh, open mic time. Yes. Sorry about that. Um, we're going to put a mic down here, and I encourage anyone that has anyone, anything to share, please feel free to come up. And uh, no, we're not going to run a mic back to your seat. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to turn it on. Anyone? Well, I sure didn't have it set for you, Wayne. So I just wanted to share something I'm going to miss and something that I've an observation that I had with Eddie. One is he always kind of greeted me in one way. It was, hey, Wayne. And I was, it was either a hello or a question. So it was either, hey, Wayne, or hey, Wayne. Uh, and I'm going to miss that. I really enjoyed uh, Eddie, his passion for music. He enjoyed good music and hearing good music. And uh, the other thing was my interaction with him at Fusion. It was probably some golden times because he, uh, he enjoyed being part of it. He enjoyed the camping atmosphere. He enjoyed what was going on there with the youth. And Eddie loved to see things happen. He loved to see things happen even more in the church, like things were going on. He loved to see things going on. He loved to see things be uh, people doing things, things being established. And if he could be a part of that, if he could have some role in that, it was even better. And I just, to me, that's the attitude I want to have. I want to see things happen. If I can be a little part of it, even better. But that's the attitude we need to have, and I'm going to take from Eddie. So for me, um, kind of lost track of Eddie the last 15 years or so. We moved away and lost track of him. But um, I go back to about 18 years when I first met Eddie. Uh, we were sitting at a restaurant table um, for one of our first conversations, and it was over where SMI is now. And I remember sitting around there. I had built a house for Lee. I was just finishing it. And Eddie came along and says, hey, we, we'd like to have a house built. Uh, and let's meet for breakfast. So we met for breakfast at, at what used to be a restaurant and is now SMI. And we sat around there. And Eddie says, uh, we get talking. He says, wait a minute. What I found out with Eddie is I always kind of knew where I was. 
with Eddie, and he says, wait a minute, we want to know, right up front, he says, uh, Lee goes to church with you. I said, yeah, I, I don't want to go to church with you. I don't want really to have anything to do with your religion or Jesus or whatever that is. I don't want, to, I, I don't want any of that. And so Betty, of course, uh, very sweet, always been. She wanted to clear up and, uh, and explain why. And so I said, okay, I understand. And uh, so will you still build my house, is, was the question. And I said, absolutely, Eddie, we'll still build your house. And uh, the one time that I know that uh, Wendy said, are you going to tell that story? I said, I don't know, but I guess I will. <laughs> the one time that uh, I, we, we were just, we, we kind of settled on building a little cabin for him to live in while we built the house because he had the dogs and wanted to move. So we built a little cabin. And, and we were just on the footer of that cabin. We had just started. I was just getting to know who Eddie was. And uh, he comes, he had bought a new pickup. He comes pulling in the driveway one day, dust flying. And uh, Betty got out and went over somewhere where the house was going to be built. And Eddie comes just storming up to where I was working. I had my back to him and down on the floor. And, and uh, he was all worked up. The, the, the hills around here make the cell phones drop calls. And I think Eddie was on the call with a bank or something, and he dropped calls, and Eddie was angry, and he threw his phone and hit the windshield, brand new truck, he phone went in all over the place, and the windshield broke, and he comes in, he, was, he came up and told me immediately. And uh, I think my reply was just something like, well, that wasn't too smart, or something like that. And he storms over to the truck to pick up the pieces to his phone, and, and Betty comes over and says, did he tell you what he did? I said, yeah. And she says, I hope you didn't encourage him. And so anyway, we, we had it, uh, fun building his house. Before we were finished, um, and Eddie and I would talk a lot, but before we were finished, I came to work one morning, and uh, Eddie was like, I'm in. What, what do you mean? He had, I think he had asked about coming to church. I think maybe they were coming to church by then, uh, asked if he could come. And I said, yeah, he could come. And he was like, I'm in. And I said, what does that mean? He says, I want to be, uh, I, I want to receive Jesus. I want to be part of the church. And so uh, from there, it just went uphill for us. Eddie and Betty blessed us tremendously. Uh, every time I'd see Eddie, I love that grin. He, I love that smile. He's always had that from then on. Uh, they have tremendously blessed us. It's the one person that I worked for that came to me about halfway through the job and says, Mike, you're not charging enough. We need to pay you more. And this is what we're going to pay you. And then you're not charging enough for your son either. So we're going to pay more for him as well. You know, whatever. I'll, you know, it's okay. Well, no, we're seeing what the subs are charging and you're not getting enough money. So they blessed us in that way, uh, but they blessed us in many other ways. It's always fun to, to catch up with Eddie whenever we came back, and, and Lee as well. So we love these Goldman boys. I'm Eddie's, na I'm Eddie's neighbor. And I'm so glad that Jesus put Eddie in my life and that I got to know him as a brother in Christ. It's like death that I ever knew in my heart before. And I just want to thank the Lord for putting him in my life and thank his family and his friends and everybody I've been around. Eddie always used to refer to people that helped him as his angels. And I'll never forget that and never forget his bravery. He was one of the bravest persons I've ever known. He wasn't afraid to say the most craziest thing in front of people just to wake them up. And I admire that about him. Thank you, Jesus. I'm Jennifer. I am Betty and Eddie's daughter. Um, Lee asked me to tell this story. And I told him I didn't want to because I don't speak very well when I'm emotional. But um, so mom met, met Eddie when I was 15 and I met Eddie when I was 16. And by the time I was 17, I had moved in with them, crashed their little honeymoon pad. <laughs> and 
one night I came out of the, my bedroom and Eddie was in the kitchen and he was cooking at the stove, had all the burners going. And I put my arm around him. He put his arm around me. And I guess that night I was really feeling emotionally needy. And I turned and I put my other arm around him, which is only significant because I'm kind of a don't touch me sort of person. <laughs> and Eddie turned all the burners on the stove off and faced me and put his other arm around me and it held me for as long as I wanted to be held, which was probably a few minutes. And when I was done and I stepped back, he just turned the stove back on and went back to making dinner. And I've told people this story before because over the course of my life, I've never heard Eddie refer to me as anything other than his daughter. Maybe, maybe our daughter or Betty's daughter, but just my daughter, Jennifer. And he's never inserted step into the relationship to put a distance. I was not his biological child, but from the time he met mom, I was his child. And um, so many years ago, I saw some little saying, maybe stitched into a pillow or painted on a canvas and sold it like Michael's. I don't, I don't know. It was just this little saying. And it said, any man can be a father, but it takes someone special to be a dad. And being here and listening to all of the stories about Eddie, there's so much that resonates with me. Y'all knew him in the same ways, in different ways than I knew him. I knew, I knew his cell phone throwing temper, <laughs> but I also knew how just very special and very happy he was, how funny he was. He always, there's so many things that I still say that are Eddie-isms that are just embedded in me. The other day I was on a conference call at work and I used the word Gesortenblatt and I don't know if any of y'all have ever heard him, but that's an Eddie word. And I'm sure the people on the call were like, what? Um, another time I was going to an appointment and I hit every detour and every traffic jam and every delay. And I remember saying, ain't no good way to get to the beach. And that's an Eddie saying as well. So there's just ways that he has put his hand on me and helped to shape my life. And I wanted to share that story because it speaks to who he is. Y'all already know that. So anyway, thank you. My name's Tom Bender and uh, <clears throat> I had the privilege for years um, coming here, I often come here at least one night a week to do some counseling <clears throat> and often Vernon and Eddie were doing uh, finances for the church. Sometimes uh, Eddie was here alone and uh, sometimes I had a little extra time and I'd start asking him questions. And so if there were, if there were errors in the finances, it's probably my fault because I distracted him. <laughs> Uh, but I was kind of fascinated with a little time in his life when he was sailing. He bought a sailboat. Was it like one or two years that he was on the sailboat? Does anybody remember? Something like that. And I was fascinated with those stories about him living on the sailboat <clears throat> and, uh, and the details about that and how that worked for him. And, and, one of the things that um, that he let me know, not in so many words, but uh, that there were he he had made some decisions regarding his family that um, he regretted, and he never told me any details. <laughs> um, But 
he always let me know that, that, that they were regrets. And if he could go back and change it, he would because he loved his family. And that's a message that I always heard from him. Um, uh, do what you need to do, Tom, to love your family. So, uh, you know, I have to say, too, the, his smile <clears throat> was infectious. And, um, <clears throat> and I think about his love for music because uh, of, of all the people I know in the earth, I think Eddie would be right up there at the top of people who love music. And there's something, I think, in all of us that God put in all of us that made this thing about rhythm and melody and harmony, we're attracted to that. God didn't have to make us that way, but he did. We're attracted to that for some reason. And, and, um, and he just reminded me of that all the time. So very good things. So I'm John Brobst. I am that SMI guy. And uh, I got to know Eddie back at the same time that Larry did. And uh, Mike, sorry, <laughs> called your brother's name. When Mike Byler was uh, building his house. And, and um, Eddie started coming to church. And um, I've got his cell phone, by the way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be all over the place. Um, he used to have a bat phone. Everybody remember the bat phone? Oh, that's my bat phone. And uh, Eddie just had so many Eddieisms. And Jennifer, thanks for sharing some of those. Um, but, you know, I, I got the joy of helping um, disciple Eddie in a Sunday school class that he was in for about two years. Uh, we got to know Eddie and Betty real well. And it's, their, their names don't just rhyme. I think that they always went together. Uh, you know, it was Eddie and Betty. And Betty would invite us over. We went to Seder suppers at her house something that I'll never forget. Um, as Eddie was growing as a Christian, you know, I got to see him grow and experience a lot of things about Eddie that sometimes it was raw. <laughs> it was just raw. But, you know, Eddie and I, we, we, we shared a lot of common interest. And being from North Carolina, he talked to that Southern draw. And, you know, I have a family in North Carolina as well. And, you know, just, just all the things that bonded us together, we count of money here at the church. Um, past seven years, you know, it was more of a work relationship with Eddie as, you know, we, we our family uh, went to a different church and didn't get to spend as much of that personal time with Eddie, but uh, in work, this is one of the things that, and, and Lee wanted to make sure I said this. So my nickname was John Boy. I say, John Boy, just like that. And I said, Eddie Spaghetti, Edward Spaghettiward. And those are my nicknames for him, and it's just something we always used. And uh, just uh, to see all the people here to hear, I mean, in the last couple of years of Eddie's life, Lynn and, and Dale and Mary, um, Mary worked right beside Eddie for many years at SMI, and just the way they touched each other's lives. Um, I see Susie and Jeff, oh my word. <laughs> I just, when I heard what you were doing, it's just, uh, blows my mind, the, the heart that you gave. And then near the end of Eddie's life, um, it was like Michelle and I, we've got to see Eddie. So it was a Tuesday before he died. Um, I showed up and there were Lee and Bibi, and I had the joy of feeding him some of his supper. And you, you saw the picture up there at the end. That was his, our little dog Paisley that we snuck into the nursing home and that Eddie got to see one last time. And just to hear all the stories, Eddie was a man that lived life. And he lived it with enthusiasm. And yes, he had an anger. He had some, some temper issues, but he wasn't perfect. And there's not a soul in here that is either. So just so blessed that he was a big part of my life and the lives that he touched, just it's amazing. Some would say I've already had my opportunity, but I didn't think uh, what I need to say fit very well at the, the opening. It's impossible 
to think about Eddie without saying Betty. And I think one of the things that has been alluded to but hasn't been said about Eddie that needs to be said is his heart for service. And I'm gonna tell you, I don't know if Betty would like this or not, but Betty came to me one time, gosh, I don't know how many years ago, but she came to me and she said, Leah, you have got to protect Eddie. And I said to my, I said, well, Betty, what do you mean I have got to protect Eddie? And she said, y'all are gonna take advantage of him at the church because that's his heart. He's sitting there as treasurer and he is gonna give and give and give and give until he's broken. If you don't stop pushing him or what, I don't even remember what the circumstances were, but that told me something that, about Eddie that I don't think a lot of people really knew. They knew he was gregarious. They knew he was, had this great smile, this love of music, all these things that have been mentioned. But the fact that Eddie was always going to give. The last few times I sat with him, he would say, I don't know. I don't know. I got to do something. That's Eddie. shorter. <laughs> um, so Lee asked if I would share um, a little bit of our story towards the end of Eddie's life. Um, so I, uh, before I say this, I want to make sure that this is Eddie's day of celebration, and so this is about him, and this is about God's work in his life. So I want to keep the focus on Eddie and on God and what he did, even though we were kind of a part of that. Um, and there was a team of us. It wasn't just Jeff and I and Ashton and Annie holding the farm down. <laughs> um, there was a team of us in place. And, uh, but I want to uh, share this, but I want to keep the focus on Eddie and on, on God and what he has done. So I was, um, and I was so good, John, until you said about feeding Eddie, and that just about broke me, uh, that memory, because I had that memory too. So um, I was driving and uh, praying, as sometimes I do, take Ashton to school, and um, I felt God saying to me, uh, Susie, there's going to be a change. And... Um, and don't hold on. And I knew instinctively that he meant it was our farm because I love our farmhouse and raised beds and our uh, basset hounds. And, um, and I just felt God saying that, you know, there's going to be a change and, uh, and you can't hold on. And I said, okay, God, so um, you place on Jeff's heart where we're to go and what we're to do. And I was silent and didn't share that with anyone. Um, in the interim, we had a picnic here at the church, and Jeff was talking with Eddie in a conversation that I was unaware of, and Eddie was saying, um, I, I want to go home. I really want to go home. And so um, I had, um, like I said, not spoken about this to anyone and just kept it inside. And... Um, I called Eddie to see how he was doing, and he was in the hospital again. <laughs> so Jeff came home, and I said, Eddie's in the hospital again. And Jeff said, Susie, we need to move in with Eddie. And I knew that that's where God was taking us. And so I said, "Let's." we prayed about it for a few days, and uh, we called Lee and um, shared the idea with Lee, and Lee was on board. And Lee said, let's get Charles on the horn. And so I said, okay, I'd, um, we got Charles and Thelma, a uh, Norma, I'm sorry, Norma. And um, we talked with them, and they were on board, and then uh, Lee said, let's call Dale. 
and so we called Dale. Um, and so and Dale was on board. And while we were talking with Dale, um, Rhoda said, Susie, I was just praying for God to send someone to live with Eddie, and he put you on my heart. And there are so many um, confirmations from God and blessings and things that God has done through this whole summer that was just like that. And so we knew what we had to do and um, talked to the hospice nurse, and she kept Eddie one more day in the hospital so that we could come um, to Eddie's house and get everything ready. And um, I called Eleanor, and she came and helped me that day and get everything ready, and we brought Eddie home. And it was, uh, oh, Jeff went to go see Eddie in the hospital. I, I, I missed that. And talked with Eddie to let him know that we were going to bring him home. And it was the most beautiful summer that we have had. And um, I have Ashton, the six-year-old boy, and anyone that has been there, uh, he's very energetic. <laughs> and so we had such a beautiful summer, though, and uh, the blessings on our life and how God worked. And I know that, um, and I want to share this to let everyone know that God is still working very powerfully in people's lives. And um, I hear about sacrifice, but truly it was a blessing to our family. And it was a blessing for Eddie. And I feel that God had his hand on Eddie and just hearing how the love that everyone had for him and God knew that he wanted to go home, and God gave him that time to work things through a little bit. And um, it was a life lesson, and I know, um, and for Ashton as well, when he gets older, I know this is going to be very impactful for him. And um, just to share a few things about Eddie, um, so one night he fell about 3 a.m. and I had a baby monitor in his room. <laughs> so, but even without that, I would have heard him fall. And I went up and he's on, he's down, and I couldn't quite get him up. And so I got Jeff, and Jeff, he's like, Eddie, what are you doing down there? And he's like, Well, I don't know. <laughs> like real funny. Like he just, you know, there he is hurt, and he was hurt. He hurt his hip. His right hip, and and uh, he was he was hurt and not being able to get up. But he just still had such a he could find the laughter in anything and the smile and the smile, and it was just such a joy for us. And of course, I you know I um, very close with Betty and Eddie and I. Some we had talks where we were both missing her, and um, but it was such a good a good blessed time for our family as well, and, and for Eddie. Um, and while we were in, of course, Ashton had to go back to school, and we live in Pennsylvania, so we needed to make the move back to Pennsylvania. <laughs> and um, Eddie was, we had to help him get ready for his, um, the next stage of his life. And, uh, and that was very, very difficult. And um, I see Bill here from hospice that was very faithful, visiting every every Wednesday. And it uh, happened to be Wednesday was the, the move day for Eddie. And I completely forgot about Bill coming, and Bill came, and it was just such a blessing. Um, you've been a very blessing in, his, in, in Eddie's life and ours. And, um, and then Eddie, uh, while he was in the hospital, then we have um, Charles and Norma's Jeffrey, uh, was not doing well, and um, he ended up passing, and that was very difficult. And I wanted to send a card for him, for them, and I found this most beautiful card that I wanted to end uh, this with, with what I'm saying. And I just love this card so much, and it was um, beautiful butterflies, golden, and it said that um, goodbye is not forever but love is. And so we can hold on to that. Like we say goodbye to Eddie on this life, um, but his love will be with us forever, the love that he has shared with us and the love that we share with him. And um, 
One other thing I wanted to mention as I look back at Rick and Mary was Eddie would throw these surprises at me. And he did love to eat. And I loved to cook, so it was a good combination. But um, it would be like two or three, and he'd say, oh, hey, um, Rick and Mary are coming for supper tonight. <laughs> I'd be, oh, okay, well, that's great. Well, let's call Lee and BB, see if they want to come too. We'll have a party. And it was just little surprises like that that Eddie did, but it made life fun. And um, it, was just, it was just such good times and fellowship at his house and with with all of you, and I thank you. And it was a blessing for us and a privilege to spend that time with Eddie. And it was what God's will was. Thank you. I, uh, I got to work with Eddie uh, first, uh, I guess around nine years ago, and then later when uh, God brought me back to, uh, to SMI, and uh, it was so many stories. Um, and I, Eddie and I connected over um, just a number of different things, uh, definitely music, um, seeing God work in the lives of young people. I think that was also something that Eddie was very passionate about, fusion. Um, and uh, so, so many memories, so many, I mean, Eddie was just fun. I, I think that, that we all know that. He, he was a hoot. Um, the memory that I'd, I'd like to share, though, uh, oddly enough, isn't, isn't a happy one, but it, it, it is, and I think you'll see why. Um, I... You know, we've hinted a little bit about, you know, uh, Eddie's, Eddie's temper. He could get worked up or whatever. And I, I never knew him that way <laughs> at, at all. Um, but the details aren't important. But um, the, the one day at work, Eddie and I got into an argument. And uh, like I said, that, that wasn't so important. We just got upset at each other. And uh, I don't remember how much later that day, though, um, but just just right there in the panel shop, we kind of bumped into each other again, and uh, he, um, he, was, he was really upset in a very different way. And I, I had no idea that, um, like, I could consider him my friend, and, and I knew that, um, that I was one of Eddie's buddies. And, um, and he, he came to me, and he was just very upset, and his head was down, and he was, he was, just, he was just wringing his hands like this. And, and he, um, he said, Christian, um, he, he said, um, I, I think he even mentioned Betty. He said, but Betty tells me I just have a terrible temper. And he just, he said, I, I just want to say that I'm sorry, and, and please, please forgive me. And it just, it dawned on me in that moment that, and, and I didn't even know that I meant that much to him. But he, in that moment, he was, he was terrified of losing me as a friend. And, uh, and then right there in the panel shop, we just hugged. And we just, uh, we just asked for each other's forgiveness. And we just hugged each other. And then I guess we went back to work or whatever. But um, just a tremendous gift. I mean, there's, I, I have lots of friends and, and wonderful family and everything, but, but Eddie is just one of those guys where if, if you were, if you meant anything at all to him, you meant the world to him. And I, I don't know that there was anything that he could have feared more than losing you in his life. And um, that was assured to me and, and whatever way I can, I, I, I guess I'd just love to assure all of us that... Uh, and, and just what, what love, there's, we know that there's only one place that love like that comes from, and, and that's from Christ. And, and I, I, I take that with me uh, because Eddie, Eddie just showed me that so well. So thank you.
Hi, I'm, <clears throat> I'm Wendell Yoder. Um, I'm a man of a lot fewer words than some people here. Uh, I'm not, I, I've known Eddie since he's been coming to Oakdale, but then I got to know him better when he started working at SMI. He always made wars, as he will always say. And the one thing that, another one of Eddie's isms, he would always come out to the break room when I was there. I mean, not always when I was there, but when he would come out, he would say, what's up, Wendell? And then when he's time to go back to the start doing wires again, he said, well, I guess I better go back, back and start making wires again. <clears throat> um, we, we didn't really have a lot of interaction except that when I would go back, he, he made wires, cut wires, and made wearing harnesses, wire harnesses, and I was in the testing area, and I would go back sometimes and um, ask him how to do, what, what kind of a ferrule I needed on the end of this wire or whatever else, and he was always very helpful, always very kind, and um, very um, patient with me. And I mean, I don't think we ever got in an argument, but... Uh, <clears throat> And I'd also like to thank, I think somebody mentioned um, Mary Jeffries and Amy Walker and Michelle. We always refer to them as uh, Eddie's work wives. Hello everyone, I'm Jim, and uh, first got to know Eddie, he was around in 2005 when I started attending Oakdale well, with Isolde, and it was about that time he had just become a new Christian and was baptized into the faith and didn't really get to know Eddie any better until uh, Oakdale went through a period where they were uh, expanding care groups and, and starting new ones, and uh, we were lucky enough to be with Eddie and Betty, and you know, it's hard to think about Eddie without adding Betty to that. I mean, they were two peas in a pod, each an individual pea, but th 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 they were together. And um, one of the things they did well together was tell a story. And I'll never forget them telling about this one time they had just come home from the market. And you know their open concept house, so it's, you know, it's pretty big once you walk in there, but they heard a buzz and they thought, well, you know, this summer maybe there's bees uh, getting in the house and we're hearing these bees. Now, I, I can't tell the story like they told it, but they made this common thing that could have happened to anybody's, in anybody's house, they made it a grandiose story. As they walked in and they put their groceries down and was listening and trying to follow the sound and going here and there and um, their, their white dog, was that Zoe? Yeah, well, here's Zoe while, while they were gone, got into the bathroom and got one of their electric toothbrushes <laughs> and was playing with that thing down in the basement. And just, you know, how what a dog would do, like an old bone, well, he was playing with that electric toothbrush, and it sounded like bees were in the house. <laughs> they made that story sound fantastic, like it was, you know, it was like a comedy hour when I listened to the two of them. But then in um, 2017, I started to work at SMI, and not only did I get to know Eddie through our care group, but then as a, as a work mate as well. So uh, there's been a lot said about uh, Eddie at work and uh, he, he was a joy to be around and he did always have that smile. And I, I don't remember him, him being upset with me in any way, but one thing, could, could we say that Eddie was opinionated? Yeah, and he wasn't ashamed, uh, ashamed to have an opinion about something. And uh, just a couple things that I was able to do with Eddie that, uh, you know, it said that a picture is worth a thousand words. 
Well, we saw a lot of pictures, and you can really connect with Eddie just on with family and friends, the pictures that were taken with him, and he, he just enjoyed everybody. Um, John was in 2012 when we went to D.C., somewhere around that. It was John and Eddie and I went to uh, D.C. on tax day, April 15th. There was a tea party rally there rally there and we just went around to different events and, and enjoyed that of course enjoyed our ride down and back together and um, I just found Eddie being very uh, not only opinionated but he's very patriotic and he was opinionated about that so you know you knew where he stood in regards to his politics so there's just a lot of little things that I, I remember and I even made some notes that I wanted to share but everybody has said everything was on my notes. So the, the bee buzz or the uh, electric toothbrush thing came to mind and I just thought that's sort of reminiscent for me of their storytelling ability and uh, I'll always remember that. I'm Wendy Byler, I'm Mike's wife. Um, I don't have a lot to add to what everyone else has already said other than amen. Eddie was a great person. We loved Eddie and Betty. Um, we didn't get to spend enough time with them though. Um, but in the time we were here with them, um, in the first few years of fusion, I'm not sure if it was our last year of fusion or not, I, um, I was in charge of the kitchen, and Eddie wanted to help in the kitchen. And we were making pizza one night, and Eddie's like, no, let me show you how to make a pizza. <laughs> I did not put enough pepperoni on the pizza. Um, but now I make all my pepperoni pizzas like Eddie taught me to, and our daughter loves it. But um, I, we were very blessed with the short time we had to live here together with Eddie and Betty, and um, we, we will miss them. I don't want to prolong what's going on, but I, I fusion, everybody keeps mentioning fusion, and uh, I just have to tell you, after Eddie received the Lord, we moved away. Fusion happened, and he was gonna be baptized. And he called me and says, will you come back to baptize me? Fusion is a, is a youth camp that the church does here locally. And uh, so that's, a, I think, um, it, it, it's just something I always remember. We had a great time baptizing. And Lee, if I may say this, um, we're getting ready to get in the water. And he's like, Lee, come on, join us in here. And, and I have to think about that today because I think if Eddie could speak to us today, he'd say, heaven is great. Come on, join us up here. I think he would do that, yeah. I think it'd be great. I'm Lori Bender. Um, Tom and I know, have known Eddie and Betty for a long time, I guess since they started coming to church as well. And our paths crossed in a few different ways. Music was one of them. We love playing and singing with, with Eddie and Lee and Bibi. Um, they, they were so hospitable. They invited us to their home. I remember having meals there with lots of people. They loved to just serve people. And a couple little funny stories with Eddie in my interactions with him. Um, I did a lot with youth, and of course he was the treasurer, so I was always coming to him for checks for this or that, for Bible quizzing or care packages or something. And I remember one time in the fall at our church, we have a few different projects that, that went on at the same time. There were care packages for college students, there was turkey um, Thanksgiving boxes for people in the community, and we also used to do the... Uh, Operation um, Christmas Child, which was also boxes 
for for kids um, as well all over the world. And I remember coming to him and saying, Eddie, here's some money. It's for the care packages project. And then could you please reimburse me for this or that? And he said, now, now which one is this? I can't get these all straight. There's this one. There's that one. There's this one. <laughs> and it was just kind of funny because he... He just had a light heart about everything, and he, he loved the fact that, you know, all these things were happening for people, and he got to be a part of it. And the other funny little story I just remember was um, he, he loved to hang around the youth. And we've talked about fusion, but he also went on, I think he went on several creation trips. I know he, he went on at least one or two with when we were with the, the youth group. And um, in case you don't know what Creation is, it's a big Christian music festival with really loud music and huge crowds, not too many bathrooms with running water. Um, so you know Eddie had to love to, to be with the youth to, to do that kind of thing. And he went along, and I think he might have helped with food or something. But I just remembered um, he found out that there was a youth leader's tent or a youth leader's building. And this was a very special place because it had air conditioning. And it had food, like special food for the youth leaders. And it had free merch. So I just remember him going to this tent or this, this special room and coming out with this Messiah College bag he had on his shoulder, and he had this you know, special cup or special food or whatever, and he said, I'm a youth leader. <laughs> and it, it just showed how much he loved being with the youth and serving the church in whatever ways he could. He was a lot of fun, too. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to ask the Durst brothers to come up and close this out for us. And uh, I think with what they plan to do, we may want to stand, right? Is that what? Oh, the second one. Okay. You can remain seated then for the first one. It's about this time when we be in our nursing home ministry that uh, you all have been sitting for a while. We're going to do this like a, we would do that. And Eddie would be, usually it was the opposite side. Eddie was over here, my brother was over here, but the way we sat up today. And at this time I'd say, uh, we're going to do an audience participation number because you all have been sitting for so long. What we want you to do, this is a song that we like to sing. It's called Leading on the Everlasting Arms. When we get to the chorus, when I lean this way, we want you to lean this way. And when you lean that, I lean this way at the chorus, you lean that way. And we're going to do it together, and that way you get to move and all. And I always look over to Eddie and say, now, Eddie, you, go, you okay? You're going to be, hey, don't you fall off your worst tub? And he'd say, oh, I'm not going to fall off a worst tub. And, of course, the seniors would laugh at that. And I said, and by the way, I said, we want to make sure we thank Betty because uh, she was going to do some laundry this evening, but uh, Eddie needed the tub. And she said, okay, we'll do that. And, of course, the seniors would laugh at that. And Eddie always had a kick out of that. He always expected me to, to do that in our song. So we're going to do that today. We're going to sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. I'll sing a little different, a little faster. And we get to the chorus. You all can sing along with the verse if you want. But when we get to the chorus, I want you to lean because... Uh, that shows that you are leaning on the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace of mind, leaning on the it leaning sing with me safe and secure from all along leaning 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 on the everlasting on what have I to dread what have I to fear leaning on the 
blessed peace with my Lord so dear, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning, we are leaning, safe and secure from all alarm. Leaning on Jesus, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. One more time. Safe and secure from all alarm, leaning on Jesus, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arm. All right, you did a good job. Nobody fell out of their chair. Very good. All right, we're going to have you stand now. We're going to close with a song here that uh, was one of Eddie's favorites as well. because most of the songs we do, I'm a songwriter, and, I, and if I make mistakes, then no one knows. But when I sing other people's song, I got to look, make sure I got the course right, because <laughs> uh, I do anyway. But this is a little song called I'll Fly Away, and that's what we're all looking forward to, the day that uh, we'd all love to go and rapture the church, because if we wouldn't leave our loved ones behind, we'd all go together, because, again, uh, the thing of death is really it's the separation that's the sting. It's the separation from our loved ones. It's the separation, you know. The older I get and the more I have on the other side, mom, dad's over there, Eddie's over there, aunts and uncles, things like that, you know, loved ones over there, the less loved ones we have on this side except for the grandkids and things like that and the children. But, you know, if we could, uh, you know, we want to see them, but we'll miss them, <laughs> you know. But if we, if we could all go into rapture the church, that would be great. So that's what this song is sort of like. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. Thank you for the privilege of coming and uh, singing for Brother Eddie's uh, memorial service. And again, he was always there, right there with us for so many years. Thank you. So everyone here is invited to the noon meal. It's not noon, it's, uh, but you're all invited. To stay. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this special time that we've had here together. And Lord, now I ask in the na mighty name of Jesus that you would bless as only you can all those, the family and all those who are close to Eddie, Lord, as they transition through this time. And Lord, I just pray that we would remember uh, that smiling face and the heart that Eddie had and uh, remember 
uh, all the great thing, times that we had together. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, I should say, um, the really nice slideshow that Newman Funeral Home put together, uh, some of you obviously did not see the very beginning of that, but uh, we're going to run, run through that one more time. And uh, as you're dismissed, if any missed the very beginning of it and you want to see it, uh, they're going to be doing it right now. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.